What I'm about to start doing here, company with my colleagues, is a little bit more hairy than what I was doing last weekend in the Eurovision Song Contest, where if you make a mistake, you drop a couple of votes. Here, if you make a mistake, you drop a couple of hundred feet. Anyway, it's all going to be very up-tempo and uh, a little vivace on the left-hand bends, especially with the snow. So, fasten your safety belts. We're all going to try and keep between the hedges and on the island. It takes a full year's planning on the part of the Ulster Automobile Club and clerk of the course Malcolm Neal, plus 1,500 marshals, timekeepers and officials in order to organise the Benson and Hedges Circuit of Ireland International Rally. The printing in that is not very good, so you can give that one to your service crew. 120 crews checked through scrutiny at Kennedy's Garage, Bellamina, on Thursday. One third of them were from abroad. Three times winner, Roger Clark of Britain, in an experimental works Ford Escort, was making a return after an absence of four years. There were crews from Norway, Sweden, West Germany and France there to offer a challenge to those from Britain and Ireland. And so, with scrutiny as regards safety and eligibility complete, the stage was set for the start from the Bellamina showgrounds on Good Friday afternoon. Despite wintry conditions and threatened snow showers, the crowds gathered to see the expensive machinery. The Stratus for Cahill Curley and Austin Fraser was the centre of attraction. The car's going fine. Perfect, but uh, the weather conditions are absolutely atrocious. They don't suit either myself or the car. And uh, we're just going to take it very, very handy for, uh, for no other reason than the fact that we're driving to Timor or some way have been instructed to take it easy. At one o'clock, with weather predictions anything but encouraging, the 1974 winner, Cahill Curley, slid the Lancia off the start ramp. He was to lead the multicoloured cavalcade to the first of the 61 special stages at Ora Lodge, 20 miles away. Corkman Billy Coleman would be snapping at his heels. I must say I'm very nervous. Um, we gather there's a lot of snow up on the hills and these cars are, are really not suited at all in those conditions because uh, we have semi-racing engines which rely for power on the top end of the rev scale. Whereas what, what you need for that sort of condition is um, a, a car with a lot of torque. In, in other words, uh, a, a runaround car really, you know. Coleman in the Ford of Ireland backed escort had Dublin's Paul Phelan in the hot seat. Billy was driving in borrowed gear, his own having been lost in Spain some days earlier. Brian Nelson of Hillsborough with Drexel Gillespie were at number three in a BMW. Roger Clark was next in line. Well, we haven't started yet, but uh, everything looks fine so far. Hi. Roger Clark was piloting a left-hand drive escort with Jim Porter alongside. The car was powered by a fuel injection BDA alloy engine and the Clark-Porter Escort combination brought the highest standard of competition to the circuit for several years. With the number five spot empty, Nigel Rocky and Peter Scott and another escort were following Clark's exhaust trail. Adrian Boyd and Frank Main were waving the flag of the Renault Alpine Equipe. Twice winner Adrian was down on par since he was running with a near standard engine. But one thing was certain, Boyd would be trying all the way, despite the weather and despite the lack of horsepower. So off they went to tackle the first test at Ora Lodge deep in the Antrim Blends. Making sure that everything was ready for the rally cars, officials carried out a preliminary tour of the route. Conditions were at freezing point when Cahill Curley charged through in the revolutionary Lancia Stratus.
three, Glenn Dunn, Curley and Clark were joint fastest, well above the 60 miles an hour average. But after a most promising start, it was a sudden end for Cahill Curley. The Stratos burnt a hole in a piston. It was impossible to continue. Billy Coleman, complaining of being improperly tired, was in 11th place and 90 seconds off the pace. Brian Nelson had a similar problem and was as far back as 15th. Nigel Rocky led, but Roger Clark was trying very hard to move him out from that position. crew in their British Leyland Mini came to an abrupt halt at Glen Dunn. No one injured, but a badly bent motor car. The toll of dropouts was staggering. John Tansey, Greg O'Gorman, Willie Crawford, Philip McCartan and Jody Carr were on their way home before the leading drivers arrived at Sign Finn to tackle the sixth speed test. At least the weather was improving. Very slow start, mainly because uh, we had a bit of a mix-up with our service team and uh, we had to do the first three special sections and, and rough road tyres, which really cost us an awful lot of time and it's a bit demoralising as well. But uh, now we're on the right tyres and the uh, sun is shining and uh, going a bit better. Not too bad. We've had no problems at all. I do believe that we've had the wrong tyres on for most of the event. Everybody was very concerned about the snow. Um, the first stage was the worst. Uh, we ourselves arrived at a right-hander and just by God's grace we got round and I think that applies to about 90% of the field. I think at the moment we're lying about second behind Roger Clark, six seconds behind Roger Clark. There's been a lot of uh, icy spots here and there which you're always very wary of and uh, consequently you don't like to take too many chances on that sort of surface. What's your rev limit? Twelve and a half? Well, give, give me take three. <laughs> <laughs> Her ref kind of smoking and he's gone much better over his city. You like to think you know it, then go up like this. Adrian, uh, is uh, Roger looking for some tips from you on this stage? Oh, I wouldn't imagine so, no, I don't think so. Uh, he's, uh, he seems to be quite happy, he's not really looking for anything. I think he's after a sandwich here. That's what we can look for. <laughs> and saw snow on the ground, I was really tempted to pull the covers over my head and go back to sleep. I mean, I know uh, White Christmas sold a lot of records, but I'm seriously thinking of writing one I'm dreaming. I'm dreading of a White Easter. Cy and Finn, they headed into the night, and by the wee small hours, had started arriving in Ennis. Roger Clark went out while in the lead at Loch Naleem. Colin Mulkin's Avenger stopped some miles further on. Nuri Sean Campbell retired his escort with a shattered differential. Several of the Scandinavians were listed as missing, presumed expired. Good morning, Lloyd. The first, uh, what, 18 hours of the circuit of Ireland. What has it been like? Uh, very enjoyable, thank you, Mike. Uh, a bit slippery in places, but uh, the stages have been good. And uh, all the timing and organisation has been spot on, so we've really enjoyed ourselves. That enjoyment was also tiring. Some just opted out. Others were wide awake to their problems. Uh, it, it's down to two cylinders. I think we're either pack in. Uh, the valves are burnt out. We're losing half a minute of stage to on the other top times. Um, at the rate of dropouts, anything can happen. I mean, we can join the dropouts. But um, I think 
Billy will have to strike trouble before we're going to push him aside. Um, he's obviously, he knows the roads around here and he's going like an absolute bomb and his car seems to be in one piece and we're having real trouble even trying to keep up with him. So uh, I think um, we'd, we'd be quite content I think, to probably to settle the second place and yeah. play the waiting game, hope he maybe uh, makes a mistake. <laughs> With as many as 20 retirements, Billy Coleman and Paul Phelan were overall leaders at Ennis for the Works Ford team. Will Sparrow and Ron Krellen in the dealer team Vauxhall Magnum were 96 seconds behind in second place. Nigel Rocky, David Agnew and Desi McCartney were next in line. This circuit was certainly proving a severe test. Here, yes, and there's your replacement. Uh, have, have, have you now a yellow one? Give a new yellow one, haven't you? I do. You can go on and then... Uh, I think the reason for it has not been the severity of the rally. It has been tougher the first night this year than previous years. But I think it's been the level of competition. Um, <coughs> I noticed there very early on yesterday afternoon that many of the drivers who would normally sort of be quite ready to have a chat and smile at the end of a special stage were looking very grim, getting on with the job, and trying very, very hard. And I think the high fallout rate has been a result of this. I was a state Michael, I presume. Good morning, who? <laughs> the pace was also affecting the working press, but the drivers, even before daybreak, were back in action at Cratlow Hill outside Limerick. a mile down the road.
first 24 hours' work resulted in the cars arriving in a crowded Killarney around lunchtime on the Saturday. Only 78 out of 120 starters made the journey. Nigel Rocky's escort expired on Coronaher Hill. Brian Nelson and his BMW made a farewell flip on Sugar Hill, and Corkman Gerald Buckley and Michael O'Connell retired their escorts before they reached Killarney. Rally was just a pleasant memory. Billy Coleman brought in his escort 91 seconds in front of Will Sparrow's Vauxhall, and having changed to half shafts as a precaution, Coleman should have been reasonably happy. Well, happy for the moment, anyway. Um, I don't think we have a very big lead, but uh, we've had a lot of problems, mainly in the, in the field of tyres. We were very often found ourselves in the wrong tyres, and um, we dropped quite a bit of time because of that, but, uh, well, tomorrow we hope to be sorted out a bit better. Service crews were kept busy. The cars had been pounded and punished for 24 hours, and there was a lot, lot more to come. Brakes and tyres were a priority, and the engine, of course, was also given a once-over. Will Sparrow, with two minutes on the leading Porsche, was still apprehensive. Well, I didn't know the penalties. You say I've consolidated. I assume I've pulled a bit ahead of other people. Um, I'm certainly having a lot of trouble trying to pull a few seconds off Billy. Every time I take a few seconds off him, he takes them back again on the next stage. So uh, I think the, we've ended the day's rallying since breakfast with about one second uh, change in the positions. Well, this is the back tail polish of the model. Perhaps the best drive to date was that of Englishman Russell Brooks in his Group 1 Escort RS. He and co-driver Bran were eighth overall despite problems. You can say that again, yes. We've had one or two problems with the car. I even had the gear stick come away in my hand earlier but uh, we managed to get it back in and continue. Yes. So the leading 12 at Killarney with the Sunday run and even more still to come were Billy Coleman, Will Sparrow, Brian Evans, David Agnew, Desi McCartney, George Hill of England in a dealer team Vauxhall Magnum, Noel Smith of Dublin in a 2.7 litre Porsche, Russell Brooks, Adrian Boyd, Harold Morley, another visiting Porsche, Robin Eyre Monsell from Belfast in a Chrysler Avenger, Joe Pat O'Kane of Castle Dawson in yet another Porsche, 400 of the total of 1,350 miles was complete. Sunday morning at daybreak, Billy Coleman was the first to arrive up at the top of Malls Gap. It was the first of 12 difficult stages for the Sunday run, and road conditions were slippery. Could Coleman get away from Will Sparrow?
Following those 12 stages, there were several changes on the leaderboard. The Porsches of David Agnew and Noel Smith made spectacular exits. Will Sparrow ended his tremendous challenge to Billy Coleman when the Vauxhall stopped in full flight with mechanical problems. Desi McCartney and Terry Harriman in Porsche number seven closed the gap on Brian Evans's Porsche to just 15 seconds. Billy Coleman was leading for Ford by six and a half minutes. Well, it was a bit mixed. We had uh, very nasty weather to begin with and um, very wet, damp conditions and suddenly it dried out towards the evening and uh, well, everything went very well. The Tim Healy Pass was the most frightening section for the Corkman. Yeah, well, actually, there was some, the road had just been surfaced there, and I think that's the problem. There were some loose chips, uh, and, you know, on these racing tires, any little bit of grit at all in the road, and, uh, well, you can be all over the place quite easily. It was a happy position to be in, and what did Billy's father think of his performance to date? Well, I think he's driving steady, I'd say. And uh, if he keeps going, no, so if the usual don't happen, I'd say this is a bit more exciting than football or hardly any of them. <laughs> you can't say you've until you're across the line. <laughs> We've lost a little bit of time to Desi today. He's very close on our heels, and there's a long way to go, and anything can happen yet. Well, we'll be trying to make a little ground. Uh, time will tell. In Finland, uh, we have the main sponsors. They are cigarette companies. Yes. And I think if the banner and advertisement comes, we are in great difficulties there. Belfast's Michael McGlade was seeded 125th and was now 17th overall. For his fourth rally, a tremendous drive. I wouldn't say so, no. I think it's just been very lucky. You know, I don't know. I was shot myself, I mean, to find out. I want to take it easy now. I mean, I... I did this rally, I wanted to finish it, and I still intend to finish. I mean, I don't want to do anything daft. I actually said before I did this, this was an ambition of mine to do the circuit, and I said once I did it, that was me. Finished. It's too expensive. The cost of the car and servicing was only a part of Michael Medlade's reason for being pessimistic about the future. Killarney's hotels and catering establishments seem to have been hit by inflation since the previous year. Prices were high for food and accommodation. It was estimated that the rally and its many supporters brought to the town close on a quarter of a million pounds. The circuit action restarted on Monday afternoon with a 15-mile stage, only a stone's throw away from Billy Coleman's hometown, Mill Street. Among the spectators were golf professionals Peter Townsend and Roddy Carr. We eavesdropped on their conversation. A tremendous amount of concentration must be demanded, but at the same time, I think sort of it's... Um, one of these sports where it's a reaction sport. You don't have time to think. You just do it, you see it, you do it. It's, it's so different to golf in the way that we, we, have our, we, only, we only depend on our hands. These guys are depending on their mechanics, on their cars, on, yeah, on everything. I think there's an element of luck in every sport, but probably more so in this because of the... Uh, oh, here comes, here comes Evans, look. <laughs> when you think that we, we, we often, uh, in golf it takes a long time for us to kind of get charged up and uh, you have to be near the end of a tournament or something like that and in this sport, the minute you get behind the wheel you become a kind of a demon, I think, don't you? Billy Coleman's footballing brother, John, was keeping a watching brief on his stage time. Excuse me, who's the fastest in that stage? Why, don't talk to me, please. No, I, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, my apology. Oh, definitely Coleman. Sorry. Coleman took 16, 21, 16 minutes, 21 seconds. Yes. Uh, next was McCartney running immediately behind him with 16 minutes, 31 seconds. Yes. And Evans, Brian Evans, 16 minutes, 37 seconds. Very good. So Coleman seems to be comfortably extending his lead. Right. Thanks very much.
there were changes in the leaderboard as the crews made their way into County Tipperary. Desi McCartney had captured second place. Adrian Boyd moved to fourth when George Hill's Vauxhall gave out. Harold Morley moved ahead of Russell Brooks to be fifth. And what about Phil Coulter? Well, I had my doubts yesterday in, in Killarney and a couple of very hairy moments when we were sort of on two tires, two wheels, but it's a lot of laughs. Uh, we're delighted to have got this far. We can only hope we can get as far as Lawrence. But shortly afterwards, Phil Coulter changed his tune. A stone wall would pay to his effort. But the leaders kept charging on. Brian Evans, with Englishman Roger Jones at the controls, was losing valuable time because of a broken clutch cable. From Tipperary, the 50 cars still in the hunt made their way through the countryside, and by nightfall, they were speeding along a section at Killachie Cross near Tullerone and heading for a meal break at Kilkenny. maintained a seven-minute lead on Desi McCartney. Derek Boyd, the second of the Boyd family from Carn Money and consistently in the top 15, ended his run earlier at Moan Vaughan. Still ahead lay two of the most frightening stages of the entire rally, Ockavana and Sally Gap. Sally Gap, a 29-miler, was an endurance test. Right on schedule, Billy Coleman was the first to arrive at the end. Billy, what did you think of that stage? Hectic. Hectic? What, yeah. what time had you got on it? Um, looks like... 28 and a half minutes. 28 and a half minutes, you, you, you're just a minute and a half over a bogey. That's a, that's a terrific time. Yeah, well, let's see what the others have got before we say that. Okay. Uh, there was a lot of water on the road, which had turned into ice, and so it was a bit dicey over some of the bends. Um, apart from that, nothing, but it just went on and on and on. I think anybody who got to the end of this stage deserves a medal. <laughs> oh, incredible. Absolutely incredible. I lost about 10 pounds in weight. Right through the night, they continued to drive. Joe Pat O'Kane dropped out, and Brendan Fagan made it into seventh place with his escort, but there were few changes among the top six. Adrian Boyd was fourth in front of Harold Morley. We should be able to uh, keep him, I think, behind us. All right. Guide over into the twisty, twisty stuff again. Come up the side. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> last test consisted of a short slalom course at Nuts Corner. 7,000 spectators came to watch the action. This car is the sole survivor of the Ford Works team, and Billy Coleman has been more or less nursing it now for the last day of this rally. And as I say, rumours fly in this business, but there is a rumour that the car uh, has not been going too well recently. We have uh, a digital clock here on the screen, which will be timing for us. This is purely for interest, not the official time on the rally. 
Uh, but uh, Billy Coleman there, no doubt, will be hearing all sorts of little gremlins in his motor car at the moment. This is the time when you're desperately tired and uh, you desperately just want to get to Larne and get it all over with. And when he does get there, and if he maintains his advantage, he's off very slowly off the line, not taking any stress in this motor car. Just prepare to nurse it around the second last stage of this uh, famous rally. Over a little bit of rough there now. Up over the bridge, and the car should yump slightly, throwing it in to the left-hander, and then a long, never-ending right-hander, which tightens up rather nastily out of the back. Billy Coleman, of course, leapt into prominence a few years ago in the circuit of Ireland, when uh, completely unknown almost, uh, this uh, driver from Mill Street Cork just suddenly appeared amongst the leaders after the Killarney run. Since then, he's gone from strength to strength. And uh, as I say, he won the RAC Championship last year. He's also won the opening round of the RAC Championship this year. And now, if he wins today in Lawn, this will be his first international rally success. And who better to deserve it? Just going across the thing, 56.3, we got it there. And there's number two, Desi McCartney from Lawn. Desi McCartney in the Porsche Carrera, who really has to go. And just look at the difference. This is the man who's so much in the hunt at the moment. And Brian Evans right behind him. I've been battling out the last stages of the circuit throughout all of last night and uh, right to the very bitter end in line. Desi McCartney just tiptoeing around in lots of opposite lock there as he comes into the little S's. And this should be spectacular to watch. The Porsche Carreras, those very expensive and beautiful rally cars, about 8,000 or 9,000 pounds where the motor car that is. And the car that, uh, since it came out, has won all the Circuit of Ireland rallies. And this is the first uh, year, in fact, in three years, that it has been beaten. He's really going. Much quicker than uh, Coleman, not surprising. 52.9 on the clock. So, Terry Harriman sitting in the passenger seat. Uh, Terry Harriman and Adrian Boyd getting off the line with a huge great slide in the little Renault Alpine. Adrian having a tremendous run. At the moment, uh, he's in fourth place. He has only got a near standard Renault engine in this motor car, but he's driven it brilliantly throughout the rally. And the rewards are in fourth place, but he has really got to go too, because Harold Morley in uh, the first will be right on his tail, blubbling the tyres there and getting it oh so sideways. Really spectacular little plastic French motor car, this. And uh, who knows if Adrian can manage to get it. And he's spun! Adrian has spun, and this is critical. This is really critical to the overall rally position, because on the last time that we had results, Morley was only about uh, 30 seconds behind him. Still very fast, 57.3. A fabulous time that, despite a spin. And so into Lawn on the Tuesday morning rolled Billy Coleman and Paul Phelan in the Ford Escort. Desi McCartney and Terry Harriman were next in their Porsche, ahead of Brian Evans and Adrian Boyd. How did the first works drive go for the RAC champion? Well, it's been uh, a mixture of everything. We got off to a very slow start and things didn't look at all good as we headed into the first night on Friday night. But um, we found ourselves somewhere around sixth place and um, then suddenly came daylight on Saturday and things started to uh, go a bit better. And by Sunday morning we found ourselves in the lead and we've been lucky enough to hold it ever since. The margin at the end was closed to four minutes and 28 seconds. Had there been problems for the Mill Street farmer? We had reports that you were having clutch trouble and it sounded a bit sick as you came over the line. Oh, that's the first thing on the sound that comes out of the clutch of that car. Is, is if, it, if that noise stops, you're in trouble. I, I was very pleased to get round to the circuit and finish it. Because uh, prior to the start of it, we had done a lot of work and we, were, we started the rally very tired and uh, with the result during the whole rally, we were sort of very inconsistent. If you noticed in our times, we were up and down and up and down. It's a fantastic event. The organization's superb. Um, they have some of the best roads in, in the world for this type of rally. I can see, you know, Malcolm Neal has obviously built up a lot of experience over the years that he's been doing this, and uh, this has been a really a tremendous event. And, and even in comparison to any event that I've ever done anywhere, the organization here has been top class. 
one thing which I feel is worth saying from a co-driver's point of view. I've never been on any international rally, either in Ireland or elsewhere, where the timekeeping has been so perfect. Throughout the entire rally, there was never a discrepancy from the timekeepers. And this is just something that co-drivers are perpetually fighting to get their times agreed. A memorable circuit indeed, particularly for a bubbling Billy Coleman. <laughs>